Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, first of all, thank you to Joe and to Donald for inviting me to speak this evening. Uh, my, my perspective, I guess, is, is a little bit more high level in one sense. Um, I'm trying to bring a, a kind of context to the uh, whole idea of universal health insurance. Uh, using my experience from uh, lecturing in the Netherlands and in terms of the Dutch system, seeing what I've seen in the Dutch system and see how it might apply here and how we could apply it here. Okay. Um, so, I want to start really by giving a, a flavour of why health reform is happening. And health reform is happening in every country really that has a health system. It's not unique to Ireland. Much of that is driven really by the rising health care costs we see in the health system. So it's demography, it's changing medical technology, access to new, more expensive drugs, oncology drugs, heart drugs, etc. And also really a, a significant increase in people's expectations around care. People now want to have access to the best hospitals, the best diagnostic services, even if they are not medically appropriate, they want to have access to those services. That has really driven up costs within health systems and it has also meant that governments are finding it more challenging, clearly in the, the current environment in particular, to build financial fiscal sustainability in, in, into their healthcare systems. Aside from that, issues of equity and fairness have really become more to the fore. With the rising costs, healthcare is becoming much more expensive uh, for people, the sick and the sick and the old, who obviously have less access to income are finding it more difficult to continue to afford care. Equally, the low income groups are obviously finding it more difficult to continue to afford care. So equity, fairness, a significant driver of health reform as well. The consequence of that, and one tool to do that, is really introduce some form of universal health insurance system. And that's really, in some sense, a, a very summarized view of you know, why universal health insurance is being implemented in many, many different countries at present, not just in the Irish context. Um, really, in the Irish context, it's for equity reasons, as we all know, trying to get rid of our two-tier system, common waiting list issues such as that, but also the model that we're looking at is very much driven around the whole idea of competition. Um, that competition in some sense will drive costs within the system, encourage uh, better use of scarce resources in, 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 in terms of finding ways to actually use those resources in a more appropriate manner. So what I really want to do tonight is to really give you a flavour of and try and put in a context the model that I've taken from the programme from government, which in fact, it's somewhat, a little bit different, it's not somewhat, it's a little bit different than, than from, Ruth, from Ruth's perspective. Try and identify really some preconditions for universal health insurance that, that, that we might have, for the, the version that we will have, which is a competitor insurance market, not a single payer market, a competing insurance brand, brand form of it. And really take some lessons from the Dutch experience to see how we might get to, to where we want to go in terms of the universal system and talk really fi finally on the transition to it for Ireland. So it's kind of a, quite a heavy agenda given the time scale. So um, really it, it's something that I may have to go quickly over some elements of it. Ruth spoke around the ideology around healthcare and um, the, these cartoons came from the, the US debate around healthcare. And they prove in some senses what Ruth was saying, that ideology has played a large part in health reform in the US. You can see, you know, the whole idea, oh, well, universal health insurance in America was seen to be a socialist takeover of the world. You know, it was something, you know, something we wouldn't want in our free market environment. Okay? Um, and then, on the other hand, you have the other, other side of the fence where saying, you know, they don't deserve health care because they haven't earned it, etc., etc. So there are different, very strong emotions around the whole idea of introducing universal health insurance. My, my theory and thesis in some way is that, well, in Ireland, that doesn't necessarily need to be the case. Um, all political parties at some form in their history, sometime in their history, have proposed, have proposed universal health insurance. Sean McEntee in the 1950s for Fianna Fáil, many people from Labour over the years, obviously the minister more recently from, from Fianna Gales, and even in terms of the party of the free market, the PDs proposed it in 1989. So it's something that has been, had a long history in, in, in our political discourse. This is the first time it's really got to the fore in terms of actually being something that has moved into a government decision in terms of something that wants to be done. 
in my mind, the ideology around the principle shouldn't be there. But what, what should be there is, is really a robust debate around the mechanics of how it should work. We need to make sure it, it works in terms of meeting what our society feels are the objectives of the system. There are a few starting points to the discussion in my mind. Um, firstly, each country is different. Um, each country has a cultural, historical, institutional different background. So we cannot just take one system from one country and apply it to another. We can learn from experiences of other countries, but they all are slightly different. Obviously, in the context of, of the Dutch system, how it applies here, clearly there are differences between the Netherlands and ourselves. One immediate one, in my mind, is the whole idea of geography, where it's a small, geographically-sized country, while we are quite, quite uh, scattered in, in terms of our population distribution. So that is going to have a clear bearing on the form of system we have compared to the Netherlands. I also would say, I mean, there are other forms of managed competition models, which is essentially the model we're looking at. The Swiss have a system, the Germans have a system, which there are many aspects of which would be relevant for the Irish system, which may not be there within the Dutch system. The second point really is around the, the international experience. Um, it takes many years to introduce universal health insurance systems. Um, I, I have been working in a number of countries on universal health insurance over the last 15 years, and uh, some of the countries I even started working back in the late 90s uh, they still haven't got to where they are. Um, I've been working in um, a particular small Dutch, small Caribbean country recently, which is only a population of about 50,000 people. It's been six years we've been trying to work on it, and we have not succeeded in getting beyond defining the benefit package. So in terms of how it, it'll, long it'll take will be very, very difficult to do. There'll be lots of issues around the implementation of it. The third issue is a, a fairly straightforward point in many respects that, that is relevant for all sectors within the Irish economy. But we are a small country, which by its nature means we have a limited pool of expertise. And in terms of the health insurance area, it's, it's an area in particular, obviously, from, from working in the industry myself, it's an area which is, is relatively small. And it's something, you know, we will struggle in many, many areas to actually um, develop a system that's fit for purpose in many respects. So we will have to probably get capacity and take input from foreign experts in the area that will actually come into the country and give us some help in terms of doing that. So there are some preliminary comments in terms of where we go to. The, the other issue is around the model for, for which we, we are looking to get to. I am working off the assumption that the system we want is the competing insurance model. Um, in some respects, I'm, I'm really saying that the single-payer discussion has now passed. We are now on the competing insurance model. Um, I'm not saying that the, 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 the competition model is the best model. I'm just saying that this is where we are at now. That model, um, which is, in fact, in, in U.S. terms, would be considered to be um, quite uh, socialist in its outlook, you know, is, is a model that has really stemmed from Alan Eindhoven in, in Stanford University. But it's all around making sure we have competition but we also make sure we have significant elements of regulation to make sure we meet society's goals. So society's goals in many respects are enshrined as, and defined as affordability, efficiency, making sure we have the solidarity aspect that, that Ruth mentioned earlier. And, and the structure of the system is really about getting the regulation right to do so. So in many respects, most of my issues that I'm now going to list are really around getting regulation right and making sure it's fit for purpose. So what are the things that we need to do to get a, a comprehensive, competitive, universal health insurance system? Um, what, what I've done is really based upon research I've been doing in Erasmus is to, to really break them down into five or six, uh, six different categories of, of, of ideas. That really, in the time we have tonight, it's really just to, to mention them more than anything, but they are all very relevant to the system we have now because there are many things that we do not have that would need to be put in place to, to make this system work. The first aspect is, is fairly straightforward, you would think, free choice of insurer. So to have a managed competition model, you have to allow everybody to choose their insurer and periodically switch insurers. So you need to actually make sure there's incentives and there's arrangements in place that people can change insurers relatively quickly without any administrative burden. 
Part of that, though, is how you bring in the existing pool into the system in the Irish case, because we have a large proportion of the population who are, have medical cards or else are currently uninsured. So obviously how we bring them into the insurance pool would be a, a, a complicated task in many respects. Having a, a, an organization where we just transition the medical card holders into an insurance entity may be an initial step along the way, but obviously you are not giving the medical card holders free choice of insurer. So ultimately that will need to be transitioned out and you, know, you need to build in processes for them to actually do it while the state continues to pay their premiums on, on behalf of them. In terms of effective competition, a big concept but very important because competition on the model, under the model we're looking at is very much around competition between insurers but also competition between providers. Obviously, as I said, the geographic issues within Ireland mean that provider competition is quite complicated. Um, we have, unlike the Dutch system, we have a preponderance of public hospitals, um, where in the Netherlands the only remote type of public hospital would be the university teaching hospitals, which are relatively small in number. So it's essentially a private uh, provided system for the hospital sector. In terms of how we facilitate competition also in contestable markets within the primary care sector, a, 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 different, a different area of the market but no less important, is also quite difficult to do, particularly in outlying geographic areas. So there's lots of thinking to be done around how to build that competition. Aside from the, the competition aspect and contestability, we also need to have insurers to have the ability to contract Okay, in appropriate manner, manner to, der to derive efficiency. So, uh, in terms of insurers being able to contract with public hospitals, uh, currently the arrangements are in places that the state, in essence, actually sets the charges for the private insurance entities, and there's no negotiations in, in some senses. But to actually have a, a competitive negotiation process, in some senses, will drive the competition. And that's the theory of the managed competition model. The, the other aspect which I'll come back to later, I just want to signal how, now, is around the whole area of having adequate prudential regulation. What do we mean by that? We mean that there is protection in case of the insolvency of any of the insurance entities in the system. And in terms of what that means in, in the Irish context um, is, well, we currently have maybe about 2 billion euros of premiums in the private insurance system, but as we heard, we have about 13, 14 billion in the public system now and we also have another two, two to three billion out-of-pocket expenses. So depending on how much that goes into the universal insurance system, you are suddenly ratcheting up potentially the, the prudential capital requirements of insurers. And uh, the requirements are about 40% currently, so to actually change that requirement into insurance system would, would be a big upset to the system, to put it mildly, and would need to be funded. The third issue is around quality, and um, again, it's a very important issue in terms of making sure that all services provided are up to our adequate quality level. Um, customers should be, consumers should be adequately protected in terms of meet, making sure quality standards are in place. And in some, HICRA, I, I agree completely in terms of what, what Aileen said. I think HICRA is probably one of the most profound changes in the system we've had in recent years, where it actually has, you know, has a major role to play going forward in terms of quality. And I, I think, you know, in some sense, we'll probably have at least an institutional organization which is well placed to, to get involved in making sure quality is there. The other aspect is around facilitation of subsidies uh, to ensure affordability. Um, what we mean there is that the low-income groups are, in some senses, uh, subsidised by the wealthy income groups, the old and the sick, uh, the bad risks, in essence, in insurance terms, are actually subsidised by the good risks. So to, to do that, we need to have a robust risk equalisation system, something that I have spent much of my working life working on in, in terms of the Irish context, um, to make sure that it is properly... Uh, properly set out in many ways to actually uh, ensure that risk selection is not an issue. Secondly, we need to have income-related cross-subsidies within the system, which means we need to potentially have income-related premium structures. 
So the, there are many changes with, within the system that we would need, which, which is quite profound ways of making sure the revenue can collect um, premiums and things like that. Guaranteed access to care, um, timely access, a, a key tenant of the system, uh, short distances, our geographic issues will make that challenging in some respects. Final issue is, is a, a central issue, but really it's an issue we need to grapple with sooner rather than later, because we need to be clear what does universal health insurance mean? Um, what is covered? How much is covered in terms of the cost? What is not covered as much as what is covered? Because insurance by its nature says we are paying for conditions X, Y, and Z in circumstances A, B, and C. And if those circumstances are not met, what will be covered in terms of that? Key issues in terms of designing the system. So I want to skip, and it will be very quick, in terms of the Dutch system to see can, what lessons we can get out of the Dutch experience. Um, as I said, the Dutch system is almost exclusively a private hospital system in terms of the hospital size, so it means that in our context we would have significant integration issues, to put it mildly, between the public and private hospital systems in terms of making sure the public hospitals were not disadvantaged in any competitive negotiated system. Our, our recent bitter experiences around co-location, you know, in some ways, you know, is a, is a flavour of that discussion, and it's something that uh, would need to be very carefully managed in terms of doing that. Means testing. There is tiered means testing in the Netherlands. So it doesn't mean you either get paid for the premium or you don't. don't. There is a tiered system where you may get a partial subsidy. And that sort of system means that you do not, you, you soften the blow in terms of actually redistributing costs within the system. Um, Ruth mentioned that there would be significant shocks to those who may have access to private insurance now. And, and in some senses, that is the case if you had a yes or no kind of system where you would be redistributing costs between different groups. But actually, by having a, a tiered system, you can actually make sure you actually have less of an impact in terms of uh, all, all groups in society. Sophisticated risk equalization. The Dutch pride themselves on having a sophisticated system which is designed to stop cherry-picking uh, in terms of targeting preferred risk groups. It is something you know, that they continually innovate their system. It changes every year. In fact, my colleagues in Erasmus are the people who advise the ministry. And by the end of July, in fact, this, this next few days, they have to put their proposal for 2012 in. So everything changes, and it's, it's, it's an example of where regulation adapts and is adapted every year to meet the circumstances of the market. One, okay, one thing in terms of um, the, the deductibles, um, the Dutch system is based around having deductibles in the system. In other words, there is an element of cost sharing with the, with the patient. That in itself is, is, is potentially an issue which would be politically very difficult to introduce in the Irish context, but it also would be a, something that they see as, as, as fundamental to ensuring efficient delivery of care. There are waivers. Uh, for chronically ill, for certain categories of patients within the system, but it, it is designed in some way to, to actually make sure as many people as possible contribute in part to the cost of care. The other aspect is around the, the duty of care. Insurers have a role not just to provide and finance the cost of care, but also to make sure you get it at a quality standard. So it really is a fundamental shift in the paradigm. Just, the Dutch system took many years to implement, 35 years in essence. So it's something that, you know, they went through very quick. It took them a long time to do it. But they had milestones along the way. My, 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 my thesis is not that it will take 35 years here. The minister will be happy. But the point is that actually, uh, because we have many of the ingredients in my mind that would need to be there. But it is just a warning and forewarning that it does take a long time in terms of introducing the system. Um, in terms of the role of insurers, providers, everybody is clear about their role in the system. And that's something I think we have a little blurring of, of the system. Okay? So has the system been successful? There's elements of evidence to say it has been. There's greater competition in terms of price. There's less overt risk selection between insurers. There's better switching. You know, greater emphasis on provider competition. But really, on the other side, there are really is quite limited evidence. It's quite early still to say, has this worked compared to the before? The Dutch had relatively low waiting times, waiting lists in, in, in the past. Just very quickly, in terms of the Irish system, what do we need to do? Um, and what, what issues have we? 
Well, I think we need to be clear about our objectives, obviously, in terms of the system. You know, what we really mean by affordability, what we really mean by efficiency, those need to be articulated. We need to work out a way of increasing the pool, bringing the, the, the medical card holders into the pool, and also the significant numbers of the uninsured. There's about 20% of the population who currently have chosen not to buy insurance, but also are not qualifying for a medical card. So how we get them in the system will be actually probably more difficult than the medical card holders. The scope of the package, big issue, fundamental to the whole system, how much is included. Just to say very quickly, the medical card package is actually, in some respects, you might think, better than the hospital side, than the private insurance side. Drugs are covered, for example. Um, so there, there is a, a, a gap and a difference between the two packages. Competition. Um, how we facilitate in the hospital side, big issue. The income risk cross subsidies, how we get them set up. And also how we sort out this prudential capital issue. Because I think um, it said, I think, in the program for government that, um, and I think my, my understanding from the program for government, what Ruth said about competition rules won't apply, was in some way saying that we could get round the issue that we'd suddenly have to find a lot of capital for that. So I don't know. That is an issue that needs clarity because from being unfortunately involved in some of the risk equalization European court cases that they have, you know, they get complicated very quickly and, you know, it's not clear sometimes what the outcome is, so we need clarity. Okay, just, I mean, I, I, you can read the, the points in terms of institutional capacity, concern around that. Um, just the one elephant in the room I haven't really addressed at all is the cost of UHI. Um, in some senses, we don't know because we don't know the package. And I think that's one of the difficulties. Until we know what's going to be covered, we won't know the package. If it was a package which was essentially uh, up to the current public entitlement, clearly it wouldn't be you know, costly because really everybody's entitled in some way to, to that already. But if it was a very rich package, which was access to the top hospitals in the country, fully paid drugs costs, things like that, the, the reality is that it's going to cost more in terms of doing that. But more importantly, in my mind, is the, the way the cake is spread is also going to get cut up in a different way. So you will have winners and losers within the population, and it's something we'll have to actually uh, grapple with in terms of policy. Okay, um, I think I'll leave it at that given the time. Thank you.